there's Eva and one who came to came to our very first meeting in September 2021. So I, I, I even remembered his profession. So my name is Paul Hancock uh, with my wife Patricia Solar, who's sitting there taking your money. Counting it. Uh, we uh, we decided to try and go speak a club running in Nice, uh, and after a couple of short starts, we seem to have got at least a group of people who are interested in hearing interesting people talking about, we hope, interesting things. So thank you all for coming. Um, this time, uh, we, we've been constrained by the size of our venue, uh, and we, we may have to think about um, expanding somehow. We're still talking about that. <coughs> we have um, a really interesting uh, speaker for you uh, next time. The best humor is I'm Anyway, in addition to a gripping speaker this time, another really interesting speaker. More details um, ahead of the next meeting, but please put the date which is Saturday, May the 6th, into your diaries. We will, we will, we, in the form of Patricia, will send a, a save the date notice up to you. To you. Um, so, one other thing before I get on to, uh, two other things. Firstly, um, you're more than welcome to stay for lunch today, because we're not taking up the whole restaurant. This is the lunch table. So, if you, um, at, at the end of our session, please, put yourself here so that we can take orders. Uh, and the other table will be for members of the public when the restaurant reopens at 11.45 or 12. They've asked us to try and finish by 11.45. And with, <coughs> with Frank's agreement, we're gonna try and finish his talk at uh, 11.30, so we have 15 minutes of questions. But obviously, he'll be hanging around afterwards, so you have plenty of time to talk here. Um, I will uh, be sending out, as an experiment, um, an invitation to see how many people are interested in getting together for lunch somewhere, just to kind of get together and chat about nothing in particular, or maybe something in particular, who knows. But anyway, just another opportunity to kind of um, cross paths with people who you might not otherwise meet and who might be interesting company. So um, if, you, if when you get my invitation, it would be great to see you. So, um, I think I've now said everything other than introducing Frank, who I think most, most of you seem to know anyway. He's obviously a very gregarious person. Um, and, and, and he hopes that uh, you haven't between you heard all of his great stories anyway. Um, he's, he's, I've, I've, we've had a number of sessions planning today, and um, even this morning he, he came up with another story I hadn't heard before. So I think, I, I think the pit is pretty Could bottomless. You like that one? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> only, if you, only if you lose another one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a zero sum talk at this point. Story was it? Uh, the the, the, the blue liner, the, the, the carnival crew. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh, that's a long one. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have to stay for lunch to hear that one. <laughs> that's be... an easy 15 by itself. <laughs> okay, so Frank, as I think most of you know, had a, a lifetime career. He started off as a precocious musician after a bit of um, trial and error, including a sousaphone. He eventually decided that bass was his instrument of choice and uh, through his bass playing um, got into many interesting experiences that you'll hear about involving household names and um, is still kind of active, I think, in, in various ways, but at, at a distance. So, anyway, without more ado, Frank. Frank Zubak. Thank you. So, I need my cheat cards. I'm, uh, I'm in my dotage now, so you have to forgive me. I had to research my life to do this speech because my whole life has been one where I never paid attention to years. I never knew what year it was, and I had to go back and really ascertain when was it that I did this, when did that happen, and try to make some sense of it so that it might be because Paul asked me to be entertaining. Uh, so now I'm nervous. 
and I haven't been nervous in an awfully long time. So I'm going to talk about about 65 years of my life, actually, as a performing musician and being involved in various things in the music business, which we'll get to. But I'm not going to talk about everything. I'm not going to talk. I have a token story I'll give you about theater. I have a token story I'm going to do about recording. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about all the records and all the movies. I'll, I'll just do a story from maybe each of those fields and mostly stay focused on what happened to me that was more or less significant in my life and things that went on. And hopefully you'll find some of the people I interacted with uh, happened to be quite famous. If you were paying attention to what was up there, that was me in that film, but my back to the camera, so you wouldn't see that. Uh, so we're going to do that, and so I'd like to say a few words about my beginning. I was the uh, child of uh, immigrant parents from Yugoslavia. Uh, no one had a musical background. We uh, lived in western Pennsylvania. My father was a steel worker, my mother a housewife, uh, and then like everybody in western Pennsylvania, you wanted to get out of there. It was not a, a happy place to be. So we moved to Bucks County where they were building a new steel mill in a great massive new community called Levittown, which was being built. And it was there that I had the good fortune, first good fortune in my life, to attend a very progressive school district. And this was the Pensbury High School. Pensbury was the name of, I don't know if you, most of you probably don't know William Penn, significant man in American history, it was his home which was nearby. So this is a very progressive school district. They make, it was post-war. Uh, I was about eight or nine then, so it had to be like 52, 53 when we moved there, uh, long before most of you were ever born. Uh, but they were willing royally to try new things and progressive things for their students. Plus, they had a lot of money coming from the United States Steel Corporation in Texas. So one of the things they did was starting in fourth grade, you could elect to take an instrument and study a musical instrument. So I elected to play this, because I didn't know what it was, but I thought that would be me. It was a trumpet. So I started as a trumpet player in fourth grade, played in the elementary school band. Uh, they moved me to the sousaphone, which was a tuba that John Philip Sousa designed that you could wear while marching. And then by the time I was in seventh grade, they handed me an upright bass the grand big wooden bass because I could read the clef. And my junior high school band teacher was a swing band alumnus. Are we up here? Yes. So that's me on the bass on the right, standing up with the bass. And that was the beginning of my career. I started playing uh, for money shortly after that. I formed my first band at the end of seventh grade, going into eighth, and we played the seventh grade dance. And then we started working pool parties. All of us were in like still junior high age, and we were doing pool parties in a summer with like a 13-piece band, which was called the Velvetones. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I, by the time I was in 10th grade, I was playing in the high school band, the jazz band. We did the Johnny Carson Tonight Show. Uh, then we went on to do the Newport Jazz Festival, New Faces in Jazz, in 1963, where I managed to meet and hang with a lot of famous jazz players, Stan Getz and people like that, who I bumped into later in life. So uh, I joined the union when I was 16. You had to audition in those days. Uh, I went over, I auditioned on my bass. By the time I got home, my mother had answered the phone call. I had a job that night. Love doesn't, or life doesn't get any better than being 16, and all of a sudden you're playing in a jazz trio in a beautiful inn overlooking the Delaware River. I mean, it was like, I'm in heaven, you know. So it was going to be my life. There was never any doubt in, to me or my mother, who was a widow by then. Uh, she was a big band fan, which is where I guess I got it from. But she and I both knew that this was going to be what I did forever and ever. That was never a doubt. So all through high school I played. I played jobs with my teachers. I played jobs professionally uh, and kept always managed to work. So at the uh, then high school ended and I went to college. So I had a full uh, scholarship offer to Carnegie Mellon. Then it was Carnegie Tech. 
on tuba, and, uh, but I elected <coughs> to go to Rutgers University instead, where I became a liberal arts philosophy major, don't ask. <laughs> and, and then Westchester State University called me, they needed a bass player for their jazz band. And they said, would I consider a transfer? So in my junior year, at the end of my junior year, I went to Westchester State and, and I went there. I won the best bassist at the uh, uh, Notre Dame Jazz Festival in uh, 1965, I think it was, 67, and a scholarship to Berkeley, which I never used. Uh, so that was, that was that, and then in the summers when school was out, I would go up and I would play in the Catskills. I don't know if this is going to be weird, but there's a mountain range north of New York City called the Catskill Mountains. And there were a number of resorts up there. They called them the Jewish Alps, and then there was the Italian Alps. And uh, for a while I worked at Brown's in the Catskills, which was an elaborate place and that, uh, that's the Jerry Lewis Theater at Brown's as it was then and we used to play five acts a night there and only two got a rehearsal the rest we just talked and went out and played and it was invaluable training for what I was going to have to do later in life so we did that and then we also played this one please that's me with the bass there minus some weight and uh, one of the bands I played with while we were in the the Catskills, and then the Poconos, which was the Pennsylvania equivalent of the Catskills. They were really grand resorts. So I was doing that. <clears throat> While I was doing that, and when I was back at school, I bumped into these guys in Wilmington, Del I hate this, it's starting to sound like, and then I did. But I, but I started working in what they called ghost bands. And ghost bands were kind of unique because the big band era was kind of over, but bands were being kept alive by perhaps people who had worked in them. So for example, the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, Jimmy had died some years before, but a trumpet player who was in his band named Lee Castle led his band. And this was all in the Northeast, centered, worked out of Wilmington, Delaware. Now we could be a different band in three consecutive nights with a different leader, but we had exactly the same book, <laughs> the same band showed up. And once we were in Wilmington, or uh, North Carolina one night, two nights later, we were in uh, Albany, New York, and a man walked up to me and said, weren't you just in North Carolina? <laughs> and I said, yes, in fact, we were. And he said, he said, the whole band. I said, yeah, the whole band. He said, but you were uh, Lee Castle then, weren't you? I said, Yes, and now we're Warren Covington. <laughs> it's just how it goes. So that, that was interesting. And uh, one brief story that I promised I would tell was we were on, on the road once, and we traveled by car. Uh, and we were on our way to South Carolina. And we stopped for gasoline. And it was like up in the hills, the mountains, and a little funky. And we're getting the gas, the car filled up, and a man walks up, bib overalls, big straw hat and a very, very long shotgun. <laughs> and he walked up to the window, the driver's window, and he knocked on the window and he rolled the window down and he said, y'all want to buy a ham, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and the driver looked at the guy in the front seat with him. He looked in the rear view mirror and I said, yes. <laughs> and we bought a ham. <laughs> and he trundled off and came back with a small hand. I, did, I was not fond, of, I'm sad to say, of the South when we went on the road. So that was that's what that did. And also, I worked for other bands like the uh, Howard and Lester Lannan organizations. They were considered the king of society dance music. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is we had, uh, they flew us once, a whole band down to Florida, Miami, Florida, to play lunch stayed over and flew back the next day. We're talking period, people who wanted dance music would buy a live band. They flew us down from Philadelphia and, and flew us back. And another time we went to Virginia to the Homestead, which is this grand resort in Virginia. It's very famous in America. I don't know what the European equivalent would be, but it's very, for America, she-she. And uh, we, we took a whole band down 
and I was riding down in a car, and I, you know, we're all meeting each other because we didn't know anybody. And I said, well, what do you play to the man in front of me in the front seat? And he said, I play third alto. And I said, what do you mean third alto? He said, well, I know all the third alto parts to all the arrangements. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. And he said, well, you're going to, you're in for a treat. So we got to the homestead. We went inside to get set up. And they had all the music stands and everything, and there's no music. And it's a 12-piece band, not a page of music. And we start to play for this dinner of three executive groups. All the top executives of three major electrical manufacturers in America were there. They were the only guests, them and their families. Uh, and we had Enzo Stewarty as a guest singer, so we had an act too. But this band is playing, uh, trumpets are standing up and playing an ensemble in harmony and they sit down on a saxophone and there's not a bit of music oh, wow. and it was perfect I mean I it was just so awe-inspiring I had never seen or considered that to be possible until you play a Broadway show <laughs> you do anything long enough you just read more so but that was uh, that was the big dance along the way I got recommended for a job at a big club in South Jersey called the Latin Casino. Now, the Latin Casino was a massive 2,000-seat dinner theater in South Jersey where all the top Las Vegas acts would come to play because it was just outside of Philadelphia over the bridge, and 10 minutes later, you were at the Latin Casino. It was massive, and they served dinner, and they served alcohol, and, and you got a show. And it, in the early days, it was a whole six dollars, you know, <laughs> plus dinner. I think it was six dollars. Uh, and so we played. I got to play for a lot of acts. There, the very first one I played with. Anybody remember Jerry Vale? No. Yeah. An Italian. See, you can raise your hand. <laughs> You're my age. You know. so we also. I also got to play for Jerry Lewis, Bob and Bob Goulet and Carol Lawrence, uh, Debbie Reynolds, Engelbert Humperdinck, Milton Berle, Rickles. Cody Fields, Mitzi Gaynor, oh, and the Dick Clark Rock and Roll Review, famous and mentioning only for the fact that Jackie Wilson was in the middle of singing Lonely Teardrops when he had a massive heart attack on the stage on opening night. He just went rigid, fell back, and I heard his, he was in front of me, and I heard his head hit the stage, and I looked, and I thought, he's not moving. So I stood up and yelled, is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> uh, the show stopped, they took him to the hospital, he never worked again. Uh, the big scandal in Philadelphia then was the fact that three wives showed up for Jackie, and there was a big, big fight about that. Um, and then lastly, uh, the thing that made my whole stay at the Latin worthwhile was this guy, Frank Sinatra. Um, Frank Sinatra came in for a couple of weeks. Now, we used to do two shows a night, seven nights a week, and he was coming for two weeks. I think it was two weeks. And uh, we had a day of rehearsal with uh, his conductor, Bill Miller, and his rhythm section, or Cotler was his drummer then. And uh, I was hired to play bass in the string section, the upright bass, with the, you know, the bow in the bottom of the string section, uh, which was unusual because the years before that he came, he didn't ask for that. Uh, and I was thinking, all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to do this. Bass the same. It's fine by me. Uh, so we went through the rehearsals. And then on the, the day of the first opening, Sinatra himself showed up for the last rehearsal. And I'm only going to talk about this because he was extraordinarily amazing. Because all the attitude dropped. He knew exactly what he wanted in every arrangement, how he wanted the band to sound, interpretation, everything. And I remember he sang for Tommy Dorsey, who was you know, adamant about seeking perfection all the time. Sinatra even used to swim daily to improve his breathing and lung capacity when he sang. And just the command of the whole show and the fact that he, he knew absolutely everything was astonishing. So we, we were getting ready to do the opening night show and his bass player, Gene Chirico, came to me. And Gene was a great bass player. And, and he said, um, He's going to do some pop tunes, you know, while we're here. He, he was trying to do more popular music. And he said, I hate playing electric bass. 
He said, and you play electric bass, so would you mind playing electric bass? I said, no, I don't mind at all. You know, so they redid stuff, and I got my bass, my electric bass, and they positioned me. And, and um, so we did the show, first show, and that was that. And then we came back for the second show, and his drummer came out, Eric Kotler, and he stopped right by, well, right beside him, and he said, um, he really likes the way you play. And I said, what? He said, he really likes the way you play. I said, oh, that's nice, you know. Like, so we did the second show. Uh, the next night we came back, and Eric walked out again and said, he really likes the way you play. <laughs> I said, oh, that's nice, Eric, but I don't think he's gonna carry two bass players. That's, I don't think that's just gonna happen. He said, well, you should think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I said, maybe. And so we're playing the, the show, and um, I had this little obligato in the intro, intro to one of the pop tunes, and he said to me in the middle of it, he said, look up. And I looked up, and Sinatra was standing in front of me, looking at me while I played this thing, gave me this huge smile, and then he turned around and sang. And he did that every show for the run. And it just meant to me, it was like, wow, you know, I mean, I couldn't imagine that in a million years that Sinatra was like, liking my electric bass playing so much. That was uh, one of the highlights, the definite highlights of my career. Uh, while I was there, I was also a professional music copyist back in the days when you copied music from a score by hand, so you also had to be part of an artist. And then I was involved in the disco era, mostly with the Sal Soul Orchestra. You probably don't know that, but uh, they had some really big records in the disco era, and I'll just skip over that. Uh, so the Latin, the Latin, I started at the Latin, I was there the last seven years, six or seven years it was open, uh, because in those days in Atlantic City, you were only open in the winter, and in the summer, nobody wanted to go there. They all went to the shore, because Atlantic City and the Atlantic Ocean, hour and a half drive. You know, so you go down, you spend a day, come back, and so I would go, too, to the shore. I went to the Steel Pier, and this was the Steel Pier, and it was literally a pier that ran out several hundred yards into the Atlantic Ocean. It did things like it had a human cannonball, a guy got shot out of a cannon. It had a world-famous diving horse. A woman drove off a platform on a horse about three stories up. Almost got killed one day. And it had a huge theater. And we had a band there, you know, not a terribly big band, maybe nine pieces. And we would have acts. Now, a lot of the acts would be from the old Ed Sullivan show. Does anybody? Ed Sullivan was a variety show, and he would have circus acts on, like a juggler, somebody who did something famous, uh, magicians. He would have all kinds, and we'd have a lot of those people. Uh, but we always had a singer, too. So we would do three, four shows a day, unless it was raining, then we might do six to 10, because nobody wanted to be outdoors and they could come and hang inside at the theater. Uh, and I'm only gonna mention this because in 1978, uh, we did uh, Al Martino. Anybody remember who Al Martino is? How many people saw The Godfather? Oh, yeah. All right, The Godfather, uh, Johnny Fontaine, the singer who gets the guy the dead horse's head in his bed to mm -hmm. become, that was Al Martino who was the singer. And I'm gonna take the time to tell this story because this is in Al's own words. Um, and in 72, uh, Vic Damone was supposed to do that role in The Godfather. The producer, Mr. Ruddy, had hired him to do it. Then he hired Francis Ford Coppola to direct. Mm -hmm. And Francis Ford Coppola wanted Vic Damone. I'm sorry if I said Vic Damone first. It was supposed to be Al Martino. And then Coppola wanted Vic Damone, another famous Italian singer, to do it. So Al Martino admittedly went to his own godfather, a man named Russell Buffalino, <laughs> who was a legitimate godfather and mafia guy in Philadelphia, and uh, who started publishing articles and news things on TV that Francis Ford Coppola just really didn't know that Mr. Rudy had promised this role to Al Martino. Uh, so what happened was there got to be this big stir about who was going to do this role. Sinatra came out pro Al Martino. 
mm -hmm. you know, Sinatra was endorsing Al Marte. That was that was news, you know, for the Godfather. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Vic Damone turned around and quietly withdrew supposedly over salary budgets, but he also admitted that he did not want to get involved and in deny the mob or Mr. Sinatra. So he pulled out and Al Martino got the role. And that was the story of Al Martino <laughs> being Johnny Fontaine in The Godfather. Now, I, I did a short tour with Al after the, the Steel Pier one year, and we went to Boston. And, uh, and it, the mafia was definitely, in those days, everywhere around the entertainment business. I mean, that was just fact. It was hard to go to a big club and not have members of the mob there. I mean, it's just, they were intertwined, and they could make you or break your career. Um, it was just how it was. So we went to Boston in the uh, North End, which is a heavily Italian section of Boston, and uh, we rehearsed a band one day. We stayed overnight, and eight o'clock in the morning, I heard knocking on my hotel door. I said, God, that's what, who's knocking on my door at eight in the morning? I'm, I'm the bass player, you know? Uh, so I went to the door and just as I got to the door, I heard the door open in a room next to mine, cheap hotel. And I heard uh, Mr. Martino, and he said, yes, it was Al's room. And he said, hi, FBI. <laughs> and I went, okay, <laughs> they don't want to talk to me. So I went back to bed. Uh, when we went down to get ready to go to the club, we were just a rhythm section. They had a band from Boston, and the three of us were going to get in a station wagon. So we went down to the parking area of the hotel in front of the front doors, and the FBI was there. And they had the hood of the car up, they had the mirrors under the car, looking for bombs, and I gently said to Al, can I get a cab? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, don't worry, these guys are really good. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, ex-wife, he had an ex-wife in Florida, got hooked up with some Miami mobsters, was trying to extort money. So as any good citizen did, he called the FBI. <laughs> so that was my Al Martino story. Uh, I, the Latin Casino closed in 1978 when gambling in New Jersey was ruled to be only in Atlantic City. And that was, I knew that wasn't going to work for me. I, I predicted that it would be a failure uh, because it, you can drive to Atlantic City and go home. You know, if you want to gamble, you could drive and go home. You're not going to have thousands of empty hotel rooms unless it's a convention. Uh, and I, I turned down uh, a, a job in the first casino there because I really didn't believe in it. And I knew I was going to go to New York. And so I ended up at the uh, end of 1979 moving to New York and I opened my first business there which was called Frank Zubat Music Services. That was basically a music copy service. And it just went crazy. I mean. I guess I was a musician, and all of a sudden I was working with my lifelong heroes in jazz, uh, doing music with them. Uh, I started a big band uh, composed of all the studio musicians in New York, the really top jazz playing studio musicians in New York. Um, that did a lot to help me. And then I started contracting orchestras for recordings, jingles, movies, and things like that. I'm cutting a lot out here. Uh, <coughs> And that went, that went really well. I mean, it was, it, was, it was just great for me. And then I met a few people who, uh, I will do a, a token theater story here. Is that next, or am I out of order? Shining. I'm what? The Shining. Oh, I gotta do movies first. So in a, in a period of seven years, I did worked on about 10 movies in New York. And uh, The Shining is Stephen King, and they made a movie up. I worked on that one and a bunch of others. But the next significant one is I met uh, Wendy Carlos. Does anybody know Wendy Carlos? Stick your hand. Used to be Walter Carlos. Anybody remember Walter Carlos? You're <laughs> <laughs> old. Uh, he did an album called Switched On Bach. It was a worldwide hit where he did Bach pieces on a synthesizer, and it was the first album ever made with all synthesized music. Walter became Wendy, brilliant composer in New York, and she 
contacted me to work on a movie she had just signed with Kubrick, and it was The Shining. Mm -hmm. So um, we did the whole shot. It was recorded in, I think, Prague or somewhere like mm -hmm. that. Uh, because already in those days, in the 80s, they were already starting to go overseas to save money yeah. and use foreign orchestras. Mm -hmm. So all of that went to Prague. They did it. And surprisingly, Kubrick used very little of her music. And this is part of how I'm going to tell this because it's how Kubrick works. Um, Kubrick likes to play music while he's filming. So he'll constantly have music going on the set. And what happens is when the composer is done their piece and you go to mix the music in, he obviously can't hear something different that he, feel, it, he feels it doesn't fit the scene anymore as much as what he was playing. Mm -hmm. So on The Shining, he kept the opening theme she wrote and put in 38 other pieces of music, like from Penderecki and you mm -hmm. know, other composers, Georgi Leggetti, uh, serious avant-garde classical music composers, similar to what he did in 2001, A Space Odyssey, which was done a few years before. He did that movie playing all those records, and we call them needle drops, while he was filming. And when he hired a composer named Alex North to do the score for 2001, he couldn't use any of it. He wouldn't use any of it, and he used all the music that he had played on the set while he was recording in 2001. You can buy the Alex North version of 2001 if you want to hunt for it. It's still in print as a CD. Uh, so that was kind of peculiar to Kubrick. Uh, but then as far as Wendy went, she called me a year or two later and said, I'm doing a movie for Disney and it's called Tron. I love this movie. Uh, only because I still get royalties. <laughs> I still get a check every year on this movie. Thank God for Disney playing it on the Disney Channel. Um, so yeah, we did Tron. Uh, we recorded it at the London Symphony, which is a big step up. The movie was a big success. And uh, Wendy was very happy. She called me one day and said, would you consider managing me? And I said, sure. Uh, we met. I said, I'll, I'll send you over a, a copy of my contract as a manager. She got it. She immediately called me back and said, you mean I have to pay you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> so musicians often don't know much about their own business. It was the whole point of that. Uh, one of the things that served me well is my willingness to always learn about business and ancillary businesses. Um, I had, was given the gift of two great attorneys who taught me how to read and write a contract. So I was very comfortable in dealing with contracts and served me well for the rest of my career. Another aside before we get too much later in my career, I met a theater director named Tom O'Horgan. Uh, you've probably all heard of Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm -hmm. He did that on Broadway. Hair. Another one of his, Lenny, the story of Lenny Bruce, also him, and I think he may have directed the movie, I'm not sure. I met Tom when he was doing a show called Mowgli, um, an adaptation of The Jungle Book, very avant-garde, way ahead of its time, as Tom usually was. Um, he told me I should be a producer. I realized what he really wanted was somebody who would not say no to him. But it was, it was really good. But the purpose of this whole thing is, in, as the years went by, we did a, a show called Senator Joe. Tom had written three musicals uh, that were going to be done in repertory style in the New York theater. And one was Senator Joe. The second was going to be Nimrod based. Oh, this was Senator Joe McCarthy, obviously, if you remember the McCarthy hearings. The second one was the Nimrod legend. And I don't even remember the third one because you'll hear when life became irrelevant. We were in previews. Now in Broadway, before you open, you do previews, which gives you a chance to adjust and readjust and keep adjusting till you feel you're in shape to actually get full ticket price. They used to be greatly reduced prices during previews. Uh, we were on our third preview, and all of a sudden, they shut us down. And everybody said, like, what's going on? We have all these contracts. Like, all of a sudden, we're put out of business. Well. Uh, 
the producers, Adela Holzer and Chester Fox, were arrested by the Justice Department for fraud. It was actually the producers, like the movie The Producers, <laughs> I mean, a real life version of The Producers. They had embezzled all the money they raised for these three uh, plays, musicals, and God knows where the money was. I don't think, they, all, they both went to jail. I don't know for how long, but it, uh, it, it, it made me want to know more about the law and how the law <laughs> pertained to theater and music. Uh, I moved to the Brill Building at that point, which was also known as Tim Pan Alley. Uh, someone called me up and said I had a, a room available to see it in a suite of rooms. And I went over and my, my office mates were going to be Benny Goodman. Uh, you all know Benny Goodman? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Elliot Lawrence, you don't. Multiple Tony Award winner, Emmy Award winning band leader in the, back in the old days. And um, another copyist and myself. So while I was there, I met a couple of young men who were into film. And they said that they wanted me to meet somebody down the hall. <coughs> I went down for a meeting with this gentleman. His name was Rick Traum. A great friend to this day. Still talk to him once, at least once a week. Uh, he interviewed me. He was going to do a series. NBC had decided that the new thing in cable, which was cable, and the only thing in New York that I think was HBO, was the only thing you could get in cable. So they wanted to try original programming for expressly for cable television. And what they came up with was a show called Swing It Again. And in that show, they were going to have one of the still surviving jazz orchestras with a traditional singer, as an established singer who's been around for a while, and a cro the word crossover didn't exist then, but a pop singer, you know, and to, to also be on the show. And we were going to video two nights of those, so we'd get two shows in two days with different singers in each show. So Rick hired me as a consultant to the show to say, yes, you can do that, you know, these people won't get along, you know, they'll have a fight, you know. Um, and then three days later, he called me up and said, we need a music director. <laughs> and I said, yeah, <clears throat> would you think about doing it? And I said, sure. And he said, I, I'm out of money. <laughs> and I said, don't worry about it. It's an opportunity, right? Uh, to be with Cal Casey, Tony Bennett, Elvis Costello, Billy Eckstein and Irene Cara for two days. And as a music director, you're responsible for everything in the show musically. So the basic band was a gift from heaven. They just were so knowledgeable about how everything worked that it was a dream working with Bill Basie. It was just, he was beautiful. It was actually the last show he ever recorded uh, before he passed away a few months later. Um, and then they had, I said, who do you have? And he said, we have Tony Bennett and uh, this Elvis Costello, I said, who's he? <laughs> I, I've never heard of him. They said, well, he's coming over from England and he's gonna do a concert in Connecticut and then we're gonna get him a limo down here and he's gonna sing a song. I said, okay, and at the night, two weeks then we got Billy Eckstein, again, a walk in the park like Tony Bennett, easy, and Irene Cara. And they said, well, we can't find Irene Cara to talk to her. I said, well, get me all the phone numbers of all four people. And I called Tony. I have the number they gave me for Tony, and I said, hi, this is Frank Zubek from NBC, Swing It Again. Uh, I need to talk to Tony Bennett. He said, hey, man, this is Tony. <laughs> My best Tony impression. It's actually pretty good. Uh, he said, this is Tony, and I couldn't believe it. They had given me his home number. Not a manager, not an agent, but I had his home number. And so we got along great. I ended up working for Tony for the next 12 years after the show as a copyist and contractor. Um, I called Irene Cara the next day, uh, and she was recording with Giorgio Moroder doing a new album, and she was in LA. And she got, I got her in the studio, she got on the phone, and she was screaming, this guy's gonna drive me crazy, I keep cursing. And I said, hi, this is Frank Zubek from Swing It Again. You've got a lot on your plate right now, you know. So I'm gonna send you a cassette, because that's what there were then, cassettes. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna send it to you overnight with five songs on it that I think out of the Basie repertoire that you might fit and would like to do. And we'll talk after you get a chance to hear them and we'll pick one. 
and I'll have an arrangement written for you. We'll be cool. She said, great, I love you, thank you, done. I called Elvis in England. Surprising thing about Elvis, so I got him on the phone, his father was a swing band leader in England. I don't know what if it was under Costello or whatever, but his father had this history in swing music, and he knew a lot of songs, you know, which was incredible, and he knew a lot of bassy stuff. So I got him on the phone and I said, well, what do you think you'd like to sing with the bassy band? And he said, well, how about like Little Darling? And I was amazed. I said, you actually know the lyrics to all of it, to Little Darling? Because it was originally it was just an instrumental. It was, didn't have lyrics originally. And he said, yeah. I said, great. We'll get a key. We figured out a key. And I said, I'll have an arrangement written for you. We'll be cool. It's great. Um, Moving along, she's saying. <laughs> um, so we're, we're taping now. We're going to tape live in this big old New York giant discotheque called the Red Parrot. And Elvis shows up hoarse. He's got no voice. He had done a concert the night before in Connecticut, and he has nothing left. So Tony and I spent the entire day walking around with him, talking to him about drinking tea with lemon and honey. And it was going to be all right. And we're lucky, yeah, right. uh, but we have to shoot. There was no way not to shoot. And Elvis did himself fairly proud, I think, given the circumstances. Uh, Irene came. We dressed her up a bit like Billie Holiday, did a mm -hmm. crossfade, so she, you know, you might get the illusion of her being Billie Holiday. She was great. She knew her stuff. She did every her marks. She, she was terrific. Elvis was really nervous about everything, particularly about his voice, but. The whole thing came off. NBC loved the show. Uh, they put it out there, and everybody loved the show. Disney was really interested until they saw the price tag, and then nobody loved the show. <laughs> <laughs> so the show ended up dying. That was it. But I did start then my career in consulting because I started consulting on further projects for NBC, and which led to then this man, or a phone call one day, I'm sorry, I need my notes, please forgive me. Uh, I got a phone call uh, from a man I had played with for Shirley MacLaine. And he was Shirley MacLaine's music director when I was playing bass at the Latin. We had a great rhythm section, we all became great friends. And I got a phone call from Jet her, her music director, Don Trenner, and he said, I'm coming to New York with Anne Margaret. Now, the Anne Margaret concert was going to be a good deal. She was all on TV, all the talk shows about it, because as a child, she had always wanted to go to Radio City and perform. She never did. And she was going to come to Radio City and perform with the Rockets and dance with them. And the whole thing was a very big deal. And Don said, can you get me a really great band together? And I said, sure. So I put a great band together, not knowing that Radio City had an in-house orchestra. <laughs> didn't go over too well you know, with, the, with the band. So we had the, all these negotiation sessions at the union. Um, but we got the orchestra. She did three days, I think it was. Great reviews, fantastic stuff. And I got a phone call the Monday after she closed from the CEO of Radio City, named Jim McManus. And he said, hi, this is Jim McManus. Uh, you did the uh, orchestra for Anne Margaret this week. And I said, yeah. We never get calls about the orchestras in our, our hall. So we got calls about how good your orchestra was. And I said, well, that, thank you very much. I said, well, that makes me feel good. He said, well, how would you like to conduct all our produced concerts <laughs> and, and, and do the orchestra for them, provide, do all the hiring? And I said, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm there, you know. So I opened up a payroll company to make sure my people got paid. And I began to contract all the acts that needed an orchestra at Radio City, mm -hmm. which was the first time we did, um, oh, we were talking Moody Blues with an oh, orchestra, yeah. first at Radio City. We also did uh, Aretha Franklin mm -hmm. a number of times. Um, we'll get more to her. I did a tour with Aretha, actually, uh, in Canada. She hired me after working with her at Radio City. And we called it her Tutu Tour <laughs> because she was, enamored by dancers and we had some people from the Alvin Ailey Dance Company on the road with us for this tour in Canada and I sent her a contract and she said great she signed it she sent it back 
Now, I learned that with Aretha, you get paid at two in the morning in cash <laughs> in somebody's room in that hotel. <laughs> uh, Aretha changed her phone number monthly, so only her road manager knew how to contact her. She was always being pursued by the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service in America, for taxes. And so we went down to get paid in Toronto, and he said, all right, Zubac, and I held out my hand, and he goes, handing $100 bills, he goes, one, two, and, I, and he said, that's it? I no, wait. I said, I have a contract. I get this a day, not for concert. I work every day on this tour. You owe me $1,400. You know, like, duh. So he said, we'll have to go check that. So they, he got me the rest of my money. But when the tour was over, I offered to take uh, the dancers back to the airport in my limo because I had ground and air transportation. And I said, sure. And we got to the airport, and the limo driver said, well, who's paying for this? I said, it's on Miss Franklin's account. And they said, oh no, she said it was on a guy named Zubak. <laughs> <laughs> so she got me, she got me for that. Yeah. We also, I, I formed an orchestra called the New York Festival Orchestra to appear at Radio City. So they wanted something, and I just didn't want to have Frank Zubak on it. So we made it the New York Festival Orchestra, which for uh, um, Jose uh, Carreras came one of the three tenors, and he had been fighting cancer, and he was gonna do a concert, a fundraiser for cancer at Radio City. So they changed the name of the orchestra to the World Festival Orchestra, because they couldn't get the New York Philharmonic busy, or the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra also busy. So they called me and said, can we get an orchestra together? And I said, sure. So we had, the day before his concert, we had an afternoon rehearsal. That was it, a couple hours. And then we had a sound check the day of the concert. So the concert went really well. It got reviewed by a Salt Lake newspaper, which managed to find its way around the nation. And it said uh, about how great Jose was and everything. And they said the orchestra, while adequate, was not world class. So I got a phone call. I don't know, you may not know this name, Lou Marini. He was Blue Lou in the Blues Brothers band, if you know the Blues Brothers. Mm -hmm. He's the alto sax player parading on the, you know, on the bar. And he's a great musician. He called me up because he played in that orchestra, and most of the orchestra were Philharmonic subs and Metropolitan Opera orchestra subs. And Lou called me and he said, this guy doesn't really understand that one more rehearsal, we would have been world class. <laughs> that was nice. Okay. <laughs> I got 10 minutes left, I'm going to talk about a couple of movies. Uh, I was at Radio City now, doing all these things for Radio City, and I got a call from Radio City one day, and they said, MGM wants to talk to you. I said, okay. Five minutes later, I get a call, hi, this is MGM Music. Uh, we want to come to New York, and we're going to premiere GoldenEye, the James Bond movie. And we want, you know, if you, we want to have a concert of all the James Bond themes prior to screening the movie. Could you do that? It means getting an orchestra together. I said, no problem. And doing all the orchestra. So I had to find the music, you know, for orchestra, which was a chore. But we did it. It was very successful. They all went over to MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art afterwards, which is a casino for raising money for charity. Two years later, they called me. I went to LA to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion to do, um, what was the name of that movie? Tomorrow Never Dies. And that, uh, that was the start of a series of events with MGM. Uh, then along came this guy who came to Radio City in 1998, long after he was passed. And a friend of mine named Stig Edgren, who had, I had worked with before, had come up with this idea. They had a huge screen uh, with uh, Elvis from videos, from live shows in Vegas and TV, special singing, all these songs. They had removed all the sound except his voice. They had his band, his backup singers, and they wanted me to provide the orchestra. And I told Stig, I said, yeah, fine, it's great. So the illusion was, Radio City, you have to understand, it's a city block in New York. It's nine stories high, it's five floors below the ground, it seats 6,000 people and they were going to do three shows of Elvis. People came from around the world to see this show. People were flying in from Europe. I don't know what they were getting for tickets. 
my wife was there. And halfway through the show, all of a sudden, she said, the dead guy just got a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people were, uh, I'm here for you, all those time. It, the illusion was like you were at a rock concert and you were watching a projection on the screen and everything else was live except his voice and it was all synced and everything. And, and that, was, that was pretty <laughs> incredible. The dead guy just got, and actually he used to get two a show. And, uh, the, El the Elvis impersonators, out of respect, I guess, kept it really low key. They, they didn't mm -hmm. want to go to me before. I went on to do um, another massive thing for the Pepsi-Cola 100th anniversary in the Big Island of Hawaii with Ray Charles and Lord of the Dance. And that's a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. stories, other than the fact that it was a huge success, uh, of course. Uh, then I did a Super Bowl um, halftime present, Super Bowl award presentation to the city of Baltimore when the Ravens won their first Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And they, they built a new stadium for the Ravens. And so the, they called us to Radio City, and we were a production company, to go down and do the opening of this stadium. So Radio City called me and said, we want you to go down and music direct this thing. And I said, okay, who do you have? And they said, well, we have Aretha Franklin. And I said, well, you know she's not coming. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, you have Aretha, the Baltimore Symphony, uh, and some other players, musicians, and she's not going to show. They said, well, how, why not? I said, last year she did a concert with the Baltimore Symphony, and the symphony got up and walked off the stage. And I know Aretha well enough to know she's not going to perform with that. And I said, no, we got a signed contract. I said, oh, okay. So three days before we were going to do this event in a parking lot, which took a week to build, um, they got a phone call from Aretha's manager the quote was, Aretha's going to be sick this weekend. <laughs> and they called me up and I said, what do you do? I said, well, it's Labor Day weekend, which is a big holiday in the United States at the end of the summer. And I said, well, you've got to find somebody on Labor Day weekend who's not working. So they managed to find this guy. <laughs> and that was great. I, I thought that's going to work out well with the Baltimore Symphony. Uh, but I knew at least his drummer and I had worked together in Philadelphia, so I had a leg up, and it was, that was going to work out fine. Until his manager came up to me and said, Stevie's an artist, and he's going to do as long as he wants to do a great show. And I said, you have a problem because the contract says he has 45 minutes only. Because we have other stuff that's happening here after Stevie. And it was very specific about doing 45 minutes. And this place has to be a parking lot by 6 a.m. <laughs> so this entire stage structure, everything in this giant parking lot had to be gone by 6. So I said, Stevie has got to do 45. And they said, well, you know. So I went to the producer, the online producer, and I, online as far as being on the site. Mm -hmm. He was the line producer. And I said, you have a problem. I said, his manager just said, Stevie's going to do whatever he wants to do. And he said, wow, well, what, what do you think we could do? I said, well, the only thing I know that works with an artist, and I'm, I'm never sure that it's the artist or just his management, mm -hmm. is money. So he said, well, what can we do about that? I said, tell him that we have to charge back to him money for every five minutes the Baltimore Symphony has to stay on after 45 minutes. And he said, well, how much would that be? I said, I don't know. Tell him it's $6,000. I, I have no idea. But tell him it's $6,000 every five minutes. And he said, well, and he stormed off. That night, Stevie did a great show. 45 minutes exactly. He was in his limo <laughs> and on his way out. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. I ended up uh, signing on with Radio City to do the Christmas show uh, for 15 years. And that meant working with the Rockettes. Mm -hmm. And the whole theater is given over to the Christmas show. Every inch of hallways for dressing, quick changes. The elevators go five floors down to above the stage. And it's, it's just an incredible, incredible depressionary project. Uh, and it's still mostly the original stuff in there. Um, and I, there were still concerts, but not many. And then uh, Josh Groban, this guy came along. And I got a call from Josh Groban. Everybody know Josh Groban? Big, big smooth singer. Um, 
and they said, well, well we need strings for Josh. And I said, just strings? Because the last time he was here, I did an orchestra. He said, yeah, just strings. I said, okay. So I went to rehearsal. My string players are there. And on the stage, there's a big stairway coming down the middle. He's got this huge rhythm section with all kinds of gear on stage left. And on right are my dozen strings to balance the stage. No microphones, just music stands, no music. And I said, what are we doing? And they said, well, we needed something to balance the stage. So, And I, I said, look, these are great players. Do you give them music, let them play along or something. But, and what he had done was his entire musical act was on a computer recorded by a symphony orchestra. And he played that for the concert. And I knew that my days in the business were <laughs> coming to an end. Um, so, and, and that was pretty much the, uh, the beginning of my end and my life in music. That was about uh, seven or eight years ago, when that, I think, when that happened. And, uh, but it was a hell of a 65-year career. I, I have a lot more than I've shared with you. I hope you find, found it entertaining, Absolutely. remotely interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I will take questions. We have time for questions. Sure, sure. I, anybody have a question? Or if you want to talk to me after, I'll be happy to share anything that I didn't get to talk to you about, like theater stories or recordings. <laughs> Can we share the recordings? These are some of the rec records I did produce. Jay Lenhart is singing bass player. He's quite talented, actually. Great bass player. Trudy Desmond, mm -hmm. Canadian artist. Mm -hmm. Great record. Milt Hinton, one of the greatest bass players of all time. Uh, Columbia Records, Sony Records. Dr. George Butler called me uh, to do a series called Legendary Pioneers of Jazz. And he asked me to record Milt, which was just an honor. Yeah. And. Um, so we've made a, a Milt Hinton record unlike any other Milt Hinton record, which a few critics took issue with, but everybody else loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, he was incredible. And this is another one I was proud of. Helen Merrill, internationally famous singer. Uh, she was big in the bebop days and everything. And I was called by EMI France, who was producing this to go over and make sure the album got done on time and on budget. When I told them my fee, they said, okay. And I said, well, you don't really care about your budget then, do you? <laughs> uh, and I was really proud. But I have, I worked on hundreds of albums, uh, commercials. It was, it was a, a fun, fun career. And uh, I still blush when I think about, <laughs> I know, with Patricia wrote in that blurb that she sent out. I had three reactions. I said, is that me? <laughs> oh God, can she write? <laughs> and then I got nervous. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please, uh, uh, any questions you have for Frank, far away. Cecily. Yeah, Frank, um, is there an artist or somebody that you work for worked with that you had maybe preconceived ideas about that surprised you? Aretha? Okay. Uh, I learned, I had another experience with Aretha, another story that I cut, but now that we're at 15 minutes, I'll tell part of this. I, I did a concert with Aretha, Aretha at Radio City Music Hall. She came in for three days. Everybody <laughs> loved <laughs> Appuyez sur source sur la télécommande pour sélectionner le volume 44. Uh, and, and Aretha was a great singer. She was a phenomenal singer. But she was uh, difficult, shall we say. She traveled by bus, only would not fly. She carried an entourage with her on a bus. Uh, in this instance, she came into New York. She stayed at a very famous, very expensive hotel called the Plaza Athene. <laughs> and she had a whole bunch of rooms there. And when, when, she, when you're done Aretha's run, uh, you give her her check. You, they, they settle up with the expenses and stuff. And they, you give her a check, and then you give her armed escort to the bank. She takes a carpet bag, and they take the check, and they fill the bag with the cash and then they escort her back to the hotel. So I was part of a group. She had a new music director who rewrote her entire show. He was a client of mine. We 
copied her all of her new show, and she owed me about twelve thousand dollars. And so I went to the Plaza Athene to get paid, of course. And I saw one of the, her drummer come down and said, "She's going to be down to settle up with you. You know, she's just finishing up upstairs. She said to tell you she'll be right down." I said, "Great." She came down, carpet bag on her arm, walked up to the uh, woman to check out, tidy black uniform and the lady, and she said, I'd like to check out of my room, and I said, fine, she had a button on a computer, and it's printing, and it's printing, and it's for about three minutes, it's printing all charges to her and her entourage's rooms, because apparently they go shopping in all the stores in the Plaza Athene or Saks and have it charged to their rooms, and she was done, and the reef looked at the till, and she said, would you mind checking that again? And the woman said, not at all. She hit the button again, and it printed again. <laughs> there was nothing she was going to do about this. So I'm watching Aretha, and she's dipping into the carpet bag, and she's taking out wads of cash, still wrapped from the bank, and she's paying, and I'm thinking, God, that bag's getting small. <laughs> it's really getting small. So she finished paying the woman. She walked over to me, and she handed me $2,000. And she said, I want my music director to go over the bill. Well, I know him. He, I'm, he was a client of mine. He already went over my bill. But she didn't have any money left. It took me a year to get money from her. She used to send a check to my office uh, for $1,319.42. That's <laughs> misspelling my name. Uh, they took, my bank took every check. You know, I guess they knew what I mean. That was surprising. Uh, that was really surprising that it was, she pays her band a month in arrears. Because if you leave, then you forfeit that month. And her son was one of the band members. Was a guitarist for it. Uh, so that was kind of a weird thing, but what a great singer. So when she opened her mouth and started singing, everybody just kind of forgives everything else. Uh, anything else? Uh, Shirley MacLaine was the hardest working act I think I ever worked for. Sinatra, we talked about, knowledgeable in music. I guess I'm like, guy, send me a bottle of scotch. <laughs> I might have counted for something, Jack Daniels. And um, yeah, Shirley MacLaine was a really hard worker. Yeah, um, it, was, it was a great life, and it was uh, it was just a series of good things, lucky, fortunate, all those things, meet people. Rick Traum, who, oh, I didn't tell that story, I'll do it now. Rick Traum, who got me into Swing It Again, mm -hmm. popped up after I signed doing the contracting for Radio City. And he called me up and he said, I'm at Radio City, I'm now the CFO here, Chief Financial Officer and I want you to meet some people, so we're gonna have a lunch together. I said, okay, I'm always, I can beat by for a lunch, you know. <laughs> and we met at this chic Italian restaurant, and there was Jim McManus, the president, uh, uh, the new head of production, or the, pr the vice president in charge of production, and, uh, and Rick himself. And we talked for four hours, at the most expensive lunch I've ever been to in my life, and boy could they eat, boy could they eat. And everybody left. Uh, a day or two later, I got a call. It's, you know, Mr. McManus's office calling from Mr. Allen's team. And he said, um, I'd like you to send me a paper of what you think you could do for Radio City. I said, can I have a few days to think? He said, yeah, take your time. So I sent him 12 pages. And then asked for six figures. You know. And he called me back almost right away after he got the document. He said, well, that was a little more than I had in mind. <laughs> so we proceeded to have a negotiation about being a consultant to Radio City, which I did a lot of business consulting to. I worked a lot with lawyers in my career, which we didn't talk about, because um, I knew copyright law, I knew how performers knew the business. Lawyers don't know the business, they know the law, but they don't know the business. And it was the beginning of 25 plus years, or 20 plus years of working with Radio City, on the, them buying blocks of time at my hourly rate, which I was in, in love with. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? That's it, good, you got everything. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so uh, Patricia's just uh, 
reminded me to tell you that because um, we, we don't, uh, look, we haven't booked the whole restaurant for lunch, um, can you please um, not? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Unless you want to have lunch. Yeah, 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 I mean, please, if you want to, if you want to have lunch, please, there the that's the table over there. If we fill that up, then we can have some more. Otherwise, would you mind vacating the premises in the like, 10 or 15 minutes? It doesn't Okay, so thank you once again for coming. Look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, and uh, Frank is here. Thanks again. Thank you.